name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you wanted to digest the headlines of the last week or so, the simplest way would probably be to summarize it all as, it's not over yet. We're here back in church, in slightly straightened circumstances, but we know perfectly well that it's not over. But ahead of us lies a period of further uncertainty, further struggle and complexity. If we haven't exactly yet cancelled Christmas, nonetheless, we're all of us fairly apprehensive about what lies ahead in the next few months. And that, of course, prompts the question, what exactly would it mean for it to be over? Or to put it rather more directly, what would our healing look like? So often, as we all know, we speak about healing in terms of something that is a matter of removing a malfunction, taking something away. And yet one of the themes that seems to recur quite often in the Gospels is the reminder that healing can never be reduced to this. Remember those rather chilling words of Jesus about the person out of whom the evil spirit is cast, leaving an empty space, swept and garnished. Into that empty space come yet more destructive forces. Healing is not completed with something being taken away. Healing is also the creation of something. And that, no doubt, is why we have this morning's gospel story. A story about a healing that is only half completed when physical wellness returns. When the Samaritan turns back to say thank you to God and to Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus says, your faith has made you complete. Now the healing is finished. Something new has come into being. Something has been added, not just taken away. And that's a theme in many of the healing stories. The very first story we have about Jesus healing a leper is about Jesus' instruction to go and show yourself to the priest. In other words, rejoin the community. Come back into the fellowship from which you've been excluded and find your place there, your dignity, your freedom, your capacity to act and to praise and to give thanks. Points often made about this story from the Gospel that we've just heard, that healing is completed in thanksgiving. And the point again is often made that we, making Eucharist, giving thanks, are showing our healing. An ongoing process, no doubt, work in progress, but nonetheless, the difference has been made. And some liberty to give thanks has been kindled in our hard hearts. So that's the first thing to bear in mind this morning's readings. Healing is not just a taking away, it is a creating, it is a newness. And that newness shows itself in joy, in thanksgiving, which helps us to make a bit of sense of today's collect. We are to love what God commands. Not simply to keep the rules, grumbling a bit behind our hands and hoping that the grumbling won't be noticed. We are to love what God wills. We are to long for what God longs for. And the freedom to do that 
is the freedom to do what we most deeply want, as Paul tells us in the epistle. The problem with all those kinds of behavior that Paul enumerates at such dramatic length in the epistle, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, endings, murders, drunkenness, drunkenness, revelings, six only to be attempted, as you might say, all of those and more are the things that stop us doing what we really want, being joyful, being joyful in what God has given us, and being joyful in our relations to one another. Because if you think about it, all those kinds of destructive behavior, the works of the flesh, are kinds of behavior which make it impossible for anybody else to be really grateful for you. Promise breakers, abusers, greedy exploiters, people who put the things of this world before love and compassion, people who seek to manipulate by magic or by science, people who build division and rivalry, people who build their whole lives on ruthless competition. Are we grateful for that kind of behavior? I rather doubt it. The kind of behavior that draws out gratitude, Eucharist, in others is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of the above to be attempted. And to be attempted because they produce that delight in the world around. People in their heart long to see humanity restored to its generous essence, its deepest being, the divine image. People long to see that that is, against all probability, still possible. And when in 2 Corinthians, Paul lets himself go in a long passage about the duty we owe to one another, financial support between Christian communities, one of the motives that he draws on for that is that it will produce gratitude. Not only gratitude from the recipients, but gratitude from the world around. They are grateful to see a restored, healed, joyful humanity. Our own thanksgiving to God, our own generous delight in God, our own struggle to align our wills generously with God's. All of that is what makes the world grateful. And if the world is made grateful, the world is on the way to being made free. healing flowers into gratitude. Gratitude is the mark of wholeness. Whole lives, lives that have begun to be drawn together by the mercy and grace of God. Those lives make the world thankful. We look around and find at the moment not a huge amount to feel very thankful for. Plenty to make us afraid, plenty to make us cynical. And the Gospel this morning, reminding us of the very essence of our healing, tells us quite simply, the gift has been given, the door has been opened, peace has been made. for us to show what that peace means, to live the healed lives we struggle and seek to live, to draw others to that. But something has been done. Whether we're still struggling with a pandemic by Christmas, whether the United States of America is facing another civil war, whatever happens, whatever happens to our economy and our politics. Something has been done. The door of God's heart is flung open to us. It's been done. It's been done in the Holy Cross, which we celebrate tomorrow. The exaltation, the lifting up of that great central event where the 
doors of God's mercy are flung wide. And in the light that streams from that mystery, we see our sins as again and again, those patterns of behavior which isolate us and cut us off from other people, which stop us being sources of life and joy and gratitude to others. We see the life of grace as a life that draws thanksgiving in ourselves and in others. I leave you with one image of Holy Cross Day, which is particularly vivid for me. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, Holy Cross Day is celebrated by filling the church with sprigs of basil, the royal herb, Basilikos Royal. And once, many years ago, I was at a conference in Canada which involved us attending a Greek liturgy. And it was Holy Cross Day. And the church smelled like the kind of kitchen you really enjoy cooking. It's the powerful, sweet, pungent smell of herbs, leaves of basil trodden underfoot everywhere, sprigs of basil on the hands of the clergy and the laity. The whole church redolent in the literal sense. It's a royal gift. The royal gift which comes from those royal banners we were singing about earlier. Taking us forward, leading us through the open doors into the mystery of God's generosity, into thanksgiving, into new life, into that fullness which is the opposite of the deadly, polished, empty space into which destructive forces are so often sucked. God give us grace to lead lives that will provoke thanksgiving, that will make the world joyful, not depressed or frightened. God give us the right kind of confidence, the right kind of hope. God bring us to the fullness of healing in this and every Eucharist of thanksgiving. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.